Hello and welcome to another episode of Copper Science, the online show that puts the milk in last because we know how to make a proper copper, or do we? I am your host, Phil Bell Young, and in today's show, we're taking a walk on the creative side with science communicator, artist, and games enthusiast, Kelly Stanford, who will be sharing her secrets of effective science communication. Plus, special guest, Dr. Chris Clark, whose mouth-watering demonstrations guaranteed to leave your taste buds tingling. And as always, we'll be finishing today's show with the questions round from you, our wonderful audience. I think it's safe to say that tonight's show is going to be extremely palatable. But before any of that, just a big warm welcome once again to everyone tuning in tonight from wherever you are in the world. Please do stay in touch. Uh, let us know your opinions, your thoughts. Is there a right or wrong way to make a proper cuppa? And anything else that you want to share. You can do this using Twitter, using the hashtag Cuppa Science or the Twitter handles that you'll see beneath on the banner now or by commenting directly into the comment section beneath this live feed. And if you do that, we'll even be able to bring some of them up on the live feed like this. Hello, Max. Right, so without any more delay, it's time to grab a cuppa, don't forget the biscuits, and let's get started. Our featured guest tonight is a Manchester-based researcher and artist whose work focuses on using the power of art and games to communicate science to the public. She works with researchers and institutions from all over the world to create masterpieces that help raise awareness and inspire people to become more involved in science. Her research has now brought her to the University of Hull, where she is looking at how card games can be used as a tool to effectively communicate geosciences. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Stanford. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation today. Uh, if I stutter at all, it's because I haven't given any presentations for like the past few months due to coronavirus. But hopefully everything should be smoothly. Um, so yeah, let's get started, shall we? So about me, I, he's just uh, pretty much gone over. I'm a researcher at the University of Hull, uh, part of the Energy and Environment Institute, doing a physical geography master's, which soon will be upgraded to a PhD because the project I'm doing is just so expansive and there's so much to it. It, it just can't be contained in a master's. Uh, I have a background in art, design and art history. So I'm not actually from a science background, I'm from a art background going into science. Uh, and basically I try and use this to my advantage. So I've got an interesting perspective on how like outsiders view science and how stuff can be reverse engineered so it can be easily communicated to the masses. Uh, these are some examples of my work. As you can see, it's very diverse in its approach from cartoons about science to very detailed scientific illustrations, which get used in scientific papers from around the world, uh, to card games, to science communication sculptures, which you can find on the streets of the UK sometimes. Uh, if you follow my Twitter at all, you'll probably know me from my science communication posters. So what I usually do every week is I create a poster about a, um, a natural subject, whether it be insects, animals. It can even be like space related. So one thing I did last week was I created a very detailed poster about Beagle 2, the UK's failed mission to Mars. <laughs> Um, and all these resources are totally free for the public and communicators to download and use however they wish. So if you are going to like say an outreach event uh, and you want to use them, feel free to take them, print them off and distribute them. Um, and it, it's kind of linked into uh, my workshops, which I do in various schools and stuff around Manchester. So what I'll usually do is I'll get like a huge like class, say like 300 kids across multiple classes. 
I'll get them to sit down and do research onto like a subject, whether it be insects or climate change. They'll do this research, they'll compile it. And then I'll also combine it with an art lesson. So it, in a way, it reworks art into the curriculum while also giving a fun method skills early on on how to research these subjects if they want to go into STEM later on in their lives. Here's some um, examples of posters I've done with the school kids. This one about German wasps. Uh, another thing I do to try and get kids interested in STEM is I create these illustrated um, science pushing cartoons. So I basically take the famous pushing character and I put her in various science like roles and various STEM roles. So whether she's like a chemist, biologist, physicist, Arctic researcher or engineer, basically any like part of STEM, I try and cover in these illustrations. And so far there's about, I'd say, well, there's way over 60, but I think we're edging on 70 illustrations now. And all of these can be found on the archive link below on the Tumblr site. And I mean, again, with the posters, people are free to take these, use them how they like, print them off to use in classrooms, which that has happened in the past. Uh, researchers have put them uh, at events and stuff. I also have colour and sheet versions of these available. So if people want to take them to outreach events, they can do that as well. And also due to the COVID crisis, I thought it was a perfect opportunity to create some easily understandable posters, which include pushing to try and easily communicate how to keep yourself safe and how to avoid catching the coronavirus and spread it. Uh, basically by using the character to visually depict what not to do, what to do, and in a way also make it easy for kids to understand this topic as well because we all know it's a very complex subject and children especially may not grasp straight away what's going on so I'm hoping that these posters make it easier for them to understand uh, how they can keep themselves safe and luckily thanks to the kindness of people on Twitter that these resources have now been uh, translated into seven languages, including German, French, Italian. We've got, um, I think, not Korean, what was it? Singapore, whatever that language is. <laughs> um, and Dutch. Um, so yeah, if you want to download those and use them, feel free. Uh, these are another one as well about washing your hands and obviously not to sneeze everywhere and how to protect it, protect others uh, when you're sneezing. Uh, these are another thing that I do. Uh, I do these hyper-realistic bee and wasp illustrations in my spare time. It started off as a bit of fun, but I've managed to translate it into a way of communicating different, well, about bees, wasps, what different species there are in, around the world. Because obviously people, when you mention bees, they just think of bumblebees, but that's not the case. They come in all shapes and sizes and colors. So what I usually do with these is I'll go to events, I'll basically draw them at the events. And what it does is it acts as a method to draw people into the outreach table so that I can then talk to them about that species and talk to them about conserving like bees like native bee species and what they can do to help local bees. Because obviously we've had many issues of like invasive hornets eating like bees and destroying nests, but like parasites destroying bees nests. And also due to urbanization in the UK, it's had a profound impact on the bee population. So by doing these little art slash outreach table events, um, hopefully it will make people more aware of the impacts of these things and how they can help uh, the bees <laughs> by doing things differently. 
Uh, as mentioned before, I'm also researching games. So this is one of the games I've produced at the University of Hull. It's called Resilience. It's about climate change and it's about uh, flooding and flood resilience. So the whole idea about this is to try and make the public more aware of different types of flooding, what causes it and what they can do about it. Because I feel like a lot of people, they have the perception that flooding and stuff is something that they can't really do anything about or it's not their duty to do anything about when that's not the case. Things can be put in place to try and avoid property damage. Or if it is like a mass flooding event, they don't have to necessarily be victims to it. They can do something about it by preparing like flood resilience kits. And basically this is part of my wider research where I'm trying to use this game to find out whether card games can be a more effective method of like outreach and communication of these topics and I've, I'm doing that by doing a ver like various different versions of the game and having groups from different areas of the UK different backgrounds play this game so I've like researchers people off the street people in like say outreach events play it in groups and then I'll have them fill out a questionnaire before and after and then through that I can kind of assess if anything's changed if they've learned anything and judging by the, the uh, current data I've taken there is a significant improvement in awareness of the topics and learning of the topics after they've played the game especially when they've played the full art version which is obviously full colour illustrations and my theory is that the full colour illustrations make it easier for memory recall uh, of the topics discussed in the card. Here's some uh, examples of people playing it. This is at the University of Manchester at the Chistham Institute. So I, I basically have this massive table uh, and we just have a huge like play test against one another. It got quite heated actually. <laughs> I mean, I had this researcher go against his student and even past the time that they had uh, to complete this, they were still going because either one refused to like stop. They were that competitive. <laughs> I mean, the, the lecturer, he, he won anyway. He's very triumphant, but it's very fascinating to watch this and, and quite encouraging as well because it, it demonstrates that people generally enjoy playing the game. And here's just like a thing about the methodology as well that I'm using. Uh, the methodology is actually wider than this because during the PhD, we're going to cover how it can be used or a version, how a version of this can be used in school settings as well. Uh, okay. Oh, and this is another card game that I've done art for. So I got commissioned by PacBio, which is this biology company in California, to do a series of card illustrations, uh, basically depicting different types of viruses, fungi, uh, and like bacteria. And we paired it up with Pokemon style cards, which highlighted the superpowers of each like pathogen. Um, these were distributed at like a massive like outreach event in America. Is very positively received, so really like this project, <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully they come back to me to uh, commission some more uh, after the coronavirus crisis has blown over. And I'm also planning to do my own infectious disease games because I am generally interested in infectious diseases. I just need to get all the other projects I've got lined up done first before I do that. Oh, and another thing I do, game-related, is something called sidejacking. So it's basically where you get a normal off-the-shelf game that's got customization options, and you hijack the game so it you can turn it into a science communication tool. So in this case, I turned my Animal Crossing island into a science island. So it's got a whole science outreach section, which you can see here on the screen, covering different areas of STEM. It's got like a science maze with like sculptures. It's got a, um, it's like an Easter hunt, but of 
CERN related things. So if you don't know what CERN is, it's a particle physics laboratory in Geneva. It's where the Large Hadron Collider is based. So what I've done is I've illustrated each main detector from the LHC and I've dotted it around my island. So people have to try and find these different detectors hidden and tick them off on a checklist. Something else I've done is for EGU this year, obviously because the main event was cancelled, I thought, right, I can step in and do something about this. So we have like a games night, which is uh, organised by my advisor, Dr. Chris Skinner. And what I did was I turned one of the large rooms in me, me Animal Crossing house into the games night session. So you've got all these different things related to the games night and it basically creates a lobby where scientists from all around the world can log on to their Animal Crossing game, come over onto the island and meet up and chat. So it's kind of a step in for the lack of a, a physical session. It's very well received and it actually crashed Nintendo servers multiple times. It got so bad I had to make it so people had to DM me for a uh, for an access code so I could stagger the amount of people coming to my island at once to avoid that. But yeah, I think I'm going to do this again for AGU, which is happening in December, and possibly expand the island further so it's got even more like science representation in it. Uh, one of the other main things that I do, and it's probably the most unique thing out of anything, is I create these six foot tall science communication sculptures, which get plonked in the middle of a city in the UK. And it lets the public interact and learn about science without the pressure of being, you know, like overwhelmed by, like, say, being surrounded by like scientists or feeling like, you know, they're not smart enough for it and all those other issues that normally uh, crop up when like outsiders come into like a science like themed area. So first one I did was in 2018 in Manchester. It was in Manchester STEM B as part of the uh, B in the City art, what's it, art sculpture trail. So I designed this uh, with the help of scientists on Twitter. So I let scientists send me various like imagery and stuff they wanted covered on the sculpture. And then I created a concept illustration in Photoshop. It took ages to do because I had to try and get a, a nice, uh, a nice mixture of different like areas of science and try and get it to like work together, if that makes sense. It, it's really difficult. It took like four weeks to design and then it took a further four weeks for me to physically hand paint the sculpture as well. Um, and also another way I got scientists involved is I did a call out where I got scientists from all around Manchester to come and physically add their signature to a bee to represent their area of science as well. And they could add like, say, quotes and extra little like science facts and things, whatever they wanted to it. So we really felt involved in this project. Uh, luckily, I got a really good spot for it. So this was placed outside of one of the main stations in Manchester, and it was there for like two months. And I actually calculated this the other day, and it's estimated that over a million people would have seen this sculpture going in and out of that station during the period of time it was out. So it's huge exposure for a science communication project. Here's some of the people that came to uh, sign it, some of the famous faces. So you might recognise Daniel George, uh, you've got Tim O'Brien from Jodrell Bank, you've got my good friend Kostya Novoselov, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2010 for isolating graphene. We had loads of different people. So it, it was a really fun project, really fun. And I did a follow-up this year called the, the STEM Cow, which was for Cambridge. And we managed to smash that number out of the park. It's like 127 researchers actually came to add their signature and add their various things to this 
sculpture, uh, including like Jane Goodall and uh, Jocelyn Bell. We had the creators of the Raspberry Pi come and sign. It was really, really cool. Unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, we haven't been able to put the sculpture out yet, but we have rescheduled it for summer next year. So you will still have the chance to physically go up to sculpture and have a look at it. And this time around, I've made sure to include way more science facts, more female representation, and just like more fun things for people to just look around and, and just like learn about the various achievements of the city uh, of Cambridge. And here's just some of the pictures. There's uh, a good picture of the Jocelyn Bell portrait I did with her signature under it. Uh, got some particle tracks. Various other people who've signed it and weirdly kissed it. <laughs> oh yeah, and another key thing about these science communication sculptures is they always get sold off after their two months outside which helps raise money for the charity, for local charities in the area that they've been on display. So for the B, I managed to raise £22,000 for homeless charities around Manchester. And hopefully, with any luck, the cow will raise even more for Cambridge. And the main, the main goal for this whole project is to build this constellation around the UK of these sculptures, which basically represent the area's scientific heritage. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm running an open call, by the way, uh, for a pint science event in September. So I'm organising this science games night in Manchester. So if you have any like science themed games you want to be included in it, or if you've created a game and you need it, play testing or if you want to come along and play games just drop me like an email or you can dm me at the lab artist on twitter and i can sort something out for you thank you thank you very much once again thank you so much kelly that was an amazing talk i'm a science communicator myself, and I'm always blown away by what people are able to achieve. And science and art, at first, it seems like one of those things that you don't think will fit. But when you think about it, they just fit so well. And in fact, yeah. there's a comment here that just sums up uh, a massive part of your talk from Catherine Rutland, which is amazing art. And I feel exactly the same. It was incredible. I can't, well, I say I can't wait to see the cow. I hope I get a chance to see the cow. I might have to make a special visit to Cambridge. Um, so we are going to be doing questions from our audience in about five or so minutes. If you do have a question for Kelly, please leave it in the comment section below. Uh, and we'll be back in about five minutes with Kelly to answer those. But for now, we're going to say bye to Kelly. Bye. And we're going to check out what some of you have been saying in the comments. We've had quite a few comments come through already. We've had, uh, who's this? This is Jenny French. Uh, hello, I have a tea, even though it's probably a bit late for tea. It's never, never too late for tea. And I can see even Pint of Science agree with that. It's never too late for tea. Uh, Colin, Colin Kelsey, who's joining us from the Clun Valley in Shropshire. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, Matthew Ball asks, or Michael Ball says, it's more like wine glass of science here tonight. No judgment here. Any any vessel that holds a beverage is a cup in our eyes. Thank you for coming tonight, Michael. We hope to hear from you again later. Let's see what else we've had. Uh, greetings from Northern Ireland. Uh, I've got a martini and a box of chocolates. What a beautiful mix. Beautiful mix. I do enjoy that. Uh, hello from Edinburgh from Leslie Cunningham. Thank you for joining us, Leslie. There's also a lot of uh, talk about people doing Animal Crossing. I think uh, the games themed of the talk that's just happened has inspired more people to actually get Animal Crossing, which is amazing. Uh, and we've got here Kerry Power that says, Emily, check this out. Uh, Emily, I hope you have come and check this out. I hope you're enjoying it. And Kerry, I hope you're enjoying it as well. We've got one thing that you definitely want to check out next as well which comes to our last comment for now, which is, was that champagne I saw? 
it is in fact champagne, uh, champagne that you saw because now it's time for our special guest. Let's find out what the champagne was for. Our special guest tonight is a researcher from the University of Birmingham with an expertise in the microstructure of food. But when he's not in the lab, he is a consultant and on-camera know-it-all for a variety of popular TV shows working to make sure that their science is accurate, relatable, but more importantly, tasty. Please welcome Dr. Chris Clark. Hey. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Well, uh, first of all, I'm going to correct you. It wasn't champagne. It is Prosecco, which frankly I prefer, but you know, whatever. But we'll get to that. So I'm glad to hear certain people having a drink tonight. Obviously, a cup of tea is fantastic. Good for you. Uh, but to kick things off, I'm going to take a bit more of a roundabout approach. Um, and I'm going to actually talk about jelly. Uh, you heard right yet? Yeah, jelly. So uh, not cocktails straight away. Uh, now, I'm a researcher. I look into the sort of structures involved in food. So before I go any further, I sort of want to clarify a bit what goes into a standard jelly. Now, most people, when you think of a jelly, you think of something like this. I've got so many props, by the way. You're going to love it. So jelly, standard wobbly thing. But when you think about what it is, that's when things get a bit more complicated. So usually what we have is something like just some gelatin, just something there, leaf gelatin, whatever. So we have something called a gelling agent and we mix it with water. And what makes a jelly wobbly instead of just sort of a big wet mess is the fact that this gelling agent tends to sort of mesh together. So I think I've got a photo here of a picture I took on a very big microscope. Fingers crossed it'll come through. There we go. So this is actually a panna cotta, um, so that's sort of slightly dairy-based dessert with some gelatin in it. And what happens is your gelling agent is sort of a big mass of strandy molecules, or polymers that most people call them. And what happens is when you mix them with water and you maybe heat them up, as a standard way with gelatin, uh, they all unwind. And then as it cools down, they tangle back together again. And they make this sort of three-dimensional mesh, like a net, and we call it a matrix. Um, so not as cool as the film. But what happens is that mesh has got this sort of elastic structure and it holds all the water inside of it. So ultimately, that's why a jelly is wobbly. Uh, the elasticity comes from this net of polymers that are all linked together. So in this case, it's gelatin. Um, and the sort of more watery side of jelly, it has something called a viscoelastic property. So elastic from the network and viscosity from the liquid that's trapped inside it, which is water. Now, that's a standard example. One of these, let's say this is a gelatin jelly. But what happens if we want to use something else? Now, I want to show you something that's a bit different. So most people are well aware of jellies that are made from things that you heat up. And these are called thermosetting gels, they thermally set. But what we can do is we can make things a bit more interesting when we use chemical setting gels. And what I want to talk about to make some kind of cool cocktails here is a different kind of gel called sodium alginate and we're going to make some cocktails so i'm just going to put a little video up here hopefully if it works of an aperol spritz uh, but we're going to call it a spherical spritz because if we look closely i'm just adding the prosecco at that point there and what we can see inside that is some tiny spheres which are all circulating round and round with the bubbles and that is those little balls they are aperol so aperol is a bitter orange liqueur um, and ultimately, it's a very popular drink in Italy, uh, much cheaper than in the UK too. Here, it's crazy expensive. And what we're going to do is we're going to make one of those. And it's something that's actually surprisingly easy to do. And it's incredibly tasty. And uh, you can get all the stuff you need off various online shops, uh, Amazon to name one, but there are many others available. So without further ado, I'm just going to sort of get on with it. Um, so first up, I just want to show you the chemicals we're going to need. So we'll actually start out with the gelling agent. So before I showed you gelatin, now we're going to use a chemical setting gel called sodium alginate. You'll probably just about see that there. Sodium alginate, this is from a company called Special Ingredients. It's food grade. That's an important thing if you're going to be drinking it. And what we want to do is we're going to mix that up with Aperol. So this is the liqueur, again, hideously expensive in the UK, but it's very tasty indeed. And what we need to do is first up, you're gonna get a measuring jug and you're gonna measure out, frankly, as much as you want, but keep a note of how much you're measuring out. So I'm gonna do about hundred milliliters. So in it goes. Don't worry, I won't be wasting this because that would be a crime. 
you can have 100 milliliters. And that is my Aperol, put that away somewhere safe. And then what we need to do to that is we're going to add, I'm going to put my camera down a little bit, I'm sure you'll see me eventually. We're going to add some of this gelling agent. So this is sodium alginate. It actually comes from seaweed, um, a type of brown, well, very subtle of brown seaweed it's extracted from. Um, and it's a salt of alginic acid, if you really want to know the details. But ultimately, it just looks like sort of a not very exciting white powder, if you can see that at all. And we're just going to empty all of that into our Aperol. So in it goes. Make sure you get it all in there because it's kind of important. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to mix that all together. So I've got a little fancy whisk, but you know, you don't have to, you can use a spoon. It's whatever makes you happy. Now, the thing about sodium alginate, hopefully you can still hear me while I'm whisking. The thing about sodium alginate is that it doesn't dissolve fantastically well. So unfortunately, I'm not going to do all this now. Um, unfortunately, you have to usually mix it for a good maybe 10 or 15 minutes. But what it helps to do is to leave it to settle for a little while to let it absorb some of that water and then you can mix it again. But initially, it'll look a bit sort of messy and murky in there. But if you keep mixing, eventually it will become nice and, uh, well, nice and sort of smooth and runny. But what you're looking for is a really sort of runny, thick, globby consistency, which is, uh, well, I've got. I'm going to do an art attack thing now. Here's one I made earlier. So here we go. This is the Aperol with all of that lovely sodium alginate inside. If you want to taste it off the bat, it's actually fine. It tastes very nice. Don't taste sodium alginate on its own because it's foul. And what we then need to do, we're going to pop that to one side. We next need some water. And hopefully, since we've all been in lockdown for long enough now, we've all been eating enough takeaways, uh, you can just use a standard takeaway tub. You want a tray, something like this, with a little bit of depth to it. And you want to fill it roughly sort of maybe half full of water. So a half of standard tap water will do. And what we're going to do to that is we're going to add the other of our special ingredients, which is calcium lactate. Now, this is a salt of calcium, and it's ultimately this is like sort of the glue, I guess, that's going to bind all of our polymers together. So that sodium alginate currently is just floating around in there as like long strands of polymer molecules. And what we need is something that's going to essentially make it instantly stick together to make a jelly. And this is a really instant reaction. So I think it said already on the screen, I'm just going to use one gram of this per 100 milliliters. If I didn't say that already, it's also one gram per 100 milliliters of the uh, sodium alginate. So that makes life simple. I'm just going to pop that in straight into the water. Lovely. And then I've got a different whisk. I've got a mad selection of whisks. Just going to give that a stir. Now, mercifully, calcium lactate is a lot better at dissolving in water and the sodium alginate. So you can mix this usually for about five minutes or so, and it should all go in quite nicely. But again, I'm not going to bore you with it because it's not very exciting to watch. So let's get rid of that as well. And again, classic art sack fashion. Here's one I made earlier. And I'm just going to dab up my laptop, which I'm pouring water all over, which is rarely good. There we go. So I've got my bowl of water. And what I'm going to put into that now is the Aperol. Now, this is the important bit. This is where it all gets a bit technical. You need to get yourself one of these. Now, this is a pipette, just a standard disposable plastic pipette. You can get them online, super cheap. They're not expensive. And you can get up some of that Aperol with the alginate. And at this point, I'm going to try and get you to see what's going on down here. Fingers crossed. Now, you want to hold this about sort of 10, maybe 15 centimeters away from the surface of the water. And you're just going to drop individual drops into the liquid. Now, you sh should be able to see, hopefully, that those drops aren't actually just spreading out and going all over the place. They are instantly turning into gel. And because a drop naturally, when it falls, forms a spherical shape, it means that when it hits the water, it's immediately solidified into spheres. But it's only the outer shell that's solidified, which means the interior stays liquid. So what you have is a tiny little ball that will pop in your mouth. And I'll try and show you what some of these look like. If all goes well. 
Here we go, just get a standard fork. Get a few of those out. It's kind of like fishing this. There we go. Lovely. And dry that off. And what you should hopefully be able to just about see is you have these tiny little spheres of this Aperol, which is now in a sphere. Fantastic. So what we'll do is we're just going to pop them into a little pot. And I made a little pot here with some little holes in the bottom, but you can put it in a sieve or something like that. And at this point, you can just literally get some tap water and just give it a quick rinse. So I'm going to pour that through and just make all of our spheres nice and clean because if the salt's still there, then the gel is going to keep setting and eventually your whole sphere will just turn into a solid lump of gel, which is still tasty, but just not quite as nice. So ultimately, what you really need to do is get as many of those together as possible. And I'm not going to do it all now, so I've done some already. And let's move this out of the way. I'm trying to slosh it everywhere. There we go. And once you've made these balls, you can just store them for a while in some Aperol and they'll last for a few, well, a couple of weeks usually in the fridge. So let me just get some of those out. There we go. Now you should be able to see these a bit better now. And hopefully, it's going everywhere. You can see I've got quite a lot in there. Now you just need to get yourself a fancy glass. So ideally, some kind of Prosecco glass, or frankly, I'm happy to use a wine glass. I have no issue with that. And last but not least, the important part, you need to get yourself some Prosecco, I and mean, you can use champagne if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to complain. Nice. And what should happen at this point is as the bubbles come out of the Prosecco, as they sort of nucleate and form new bubbles, they will start to rise up and they will carry those spheres with them. But the spheres are slightly more dense than surrounding liquids, so they tend to fall back down as well. And over time, they'll just sort of form this nice sort of lava lamp effect of circulating bubbles. Let's pop that in. Obviously, I'm making a huge mess of it, but there we go. And you should hopefully be able to see there, you've got this lovely circulating bubble effect. And that will last for about sort of five minutes or so um, until what happens is the carbon dioxide actually seeps into those little jelly bubbles um, and then they'll start to naturally sit at the top. But, you know, don't need to leave it for that long. It's five minutes. That's, that's a long time. So anyway, say cheers with that one. Mm, yeah, that's good. And... I just want to say before I leave, there's one other thing I want to show you very quickly indeed, is that you don't have to make tiny balls. You can do it in reverse. So you can add the salt to the Aperol instead, and then basically chuck it in an ice cube tray and freeze it. And then instead you just sort of chuck it into a bath of the alginate instead. So what you've got then is sort of the opposite effect. And I just want to show you some examples. So this is an Aperol one I've done. So let's see if we can make so you can get one of these out intact. So what we've got here is a sphere of, actually this is Aperol with some uh, Prosecco in it already. So this is basically a ball of Aperol spritz. Um, and literally this is all liquid inside. It's all kind of squishy. And you can literally just pop that straight in your mouth. <laughs> and it goes everywhere. And I think I'll just pop one of those on camera too so you can see that it's still liquid. So here we go. So I'm just going to burst that, try and get it everywhere. And now you can see it's literally just this very thin skin that's formed around it. And if you're feeling really brave, you can supersize things. And so the last thing I'm going to show you. And so what I've done here is this is just water. So I've tried to make a giant one. And this is a giant ball of water just held in a seaweed jelly. And I'm not going to burst it because it's going to go everywhere. But if you went to the London Marathon a couple of years ago, you would see that people were handing these out as a way of reducing plastic waste. So there's not just a sort of a visual and fun thing here. There are actually some useful, serious implications as well. But on that note, I've definitely used up my five minutes. So I just want to say 
Thank you very much indeed. I just saw a question here for the person asking, is that how you make bubble tea? The answer is yes. That's how you make the poppers that go in bubble tea. Um, the rest of the little squidgy things in bubble tea are actually tapioca pearls. So slightly different. But I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, you can find all of those ingredients online uh, and the recipe as well. I think that's going to be up on the website. But in the meantime, I'll pass you back. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Chris. That was incredible. You put everyone's drinks to shame tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at mine like, ah, oh, it's just not nearly as fancy. Um, you've got a lot of fans as well. Tom Fenton says, go, Chris. Um, we have <laughs> Camlo. Great chat, Chris. And my particular favorite one, which you must have to say with an accent, which is from Max Whiteley, which is nice. Nice. We all agree is how he said it. Um, so we are. Whoops. Yeah. Whoa, sorry, I thought I pressed the wrong button. Then. Right. So thank you once again, Chris. Uh, in, we will be posting up the uh, ingredient list uh, of how you made those Aperol balls. Uh, uh, after the show on Twitter, so you can find that using hashtag Cup of Science. Uh, really quickly, if people are wondering where they might <laughs> still, oh, such a drink. People might be wondering where they can see you next, uh, or if there's any way that they can maybe get in contact with you. Do you have any shows coming up, or anything you'd like to plug? Oh, do I want to plug anything? Um, I mean, I'm the sort of person that generally pops up here and there on random occasions. Um, Keep a weather eye on Food Unwrapped on Channel 4. Um, I should hopefully be popping up on there again quite soon. Um, and in the meantime, uh, if you just sort of follow, have a little look on my website, I think the link's going to be posted at some point, or follow me on uh, Twitter or on Instagram, then, yeah, you can sort of see what I'm up to there. But generally speaking, I spend most of my time just messing around in my shed, making weird stuff. So uh, but feel free to follow me, and uh, hopefully we'll do something cool soon. So really quickly, just to announce that uh, the recipe has now been posted on Twitter. and The link is there. You can see that in the comments. And finally, Leslie Cunningham has said, thanks, Chris. A sparkling sensation. Uh, couldn't help but bring that <laughs> Brilliant. What we're going to do thanks now is say goodbye to you. We'll be hopefully chatting to you again soon. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you again, Chris, for coming on tonight. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice evening. Fantastic. Uh, again, I'm just completely blown away uh, of just how non-bubbly my drinks are tonight. I just feel so envious of that, of that Prosecco. And, and I, I feel like a few of you are saying that as well. We've got, uh, I'm going to say this name wrong. I hope I say it right. Uh, Elodie Chabrol, who says, I want Prosecco now. Cheers. Yeah, I'm the same. I want Prosecco. I want a fancy Prosecco is what I want. Um, right. So what we're going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is invite back our featured speaker of the night. So please, once again, welcome Kelly Stanford. Hi. Hi, Kelly. Uh, hey. Did you enjoy that as well? Yes. And my theory was correct about the bubble tea. I'm so happy. That your question? On that. Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> Well, we're going to dive straight into this with a question that uh, is technically on topic um, and hopefully an easier question to answer. It's from Special yeah. Flamingo. Uh, I was a bit late. Did you name the Psycom cow? Does the Psycom cow have a name? Yes. So we called her Udder Lovelace after Ada Lovelace. <laughs> that was for winning <laughs> once. We did this massive um, naming competition where people could win signed artworks off myself and a raspberry pie. Uh, and we had loads. We had like fifty odd like submissions, and that's the one we went with. It's incredible. I really enjoyed the cow. I really do want to see this cow. So we <laughs> have had quite a few questions coming in. I'm just trying to find them all. Um, brilliant. So we've got a, a first question here as well, which is actually a very interesting one. This is from Jenny French, who's asking, uh, this is super interesting. Will you test the games with both advantaged and disadvantaged schools? Yes, that is actually one of the key things we're gonna do. because we don't wanna leave anything out. We wanna get the most data possible. So it, it's a fair data set when we actually make the conclusion in our research paper. So yeah, definitely. 
Fantastic. Um, I'm going to say, again, if, if you are just joining us now, as a few people are, if you do have a question, just leave it in the comment section below and it will pop up on my feed. We have one here from Alex Avery saying, hi, love the sculptures especially. What started the interest in bees? I've always had like an in like a love hate relationship with insects. Uh, I hate being near them, but I find them absolutely beautiful when you look at them closely. Even wasps, which are technically horrible, but when you look at them up close, they're actually really beautiful and intricate. So I've always had an interest in them. And obviously, when I did the bee sculpture, it piqued my curios curiosity even further with that and the link to Manchester's work of the iconography. And it kind of just, it, it went off from there. And I started doing the illustrations and the outreach. And, and I just fell more and more in love with the topic. These are, are one of my favorite insects as well. I think a lot of people would probably say the same thing. Uh, bees are kind of that go-to favorite icon of the insect world, I think, when we, when we tend to think of that. Um, just a quick, <laughs> Uh, this is always lovely to see feedback, but uh, Jenny French has just said thank you for answering that question. Um, it's so nice that we actually get that you get the opportunity to send these games out to all kinds of different people. So thank you for that. Um, right, we've got Rose Thompson has asked, uh, do you think the coronavirus will spark more interest in studying science subjects? I really hope so, but I have a concern with the way that the subject's been dealt with and stuff. I just hope that they don't associate science with the coronavirus and see it as something bad. Because obviously we've had things where the government's been trying to pass off blame onto uh, the advisors and stuff, which don't think is entirely fair. So I'm just hoping that doesn't have an impact on this. And I hope more people just get interested in the subject because it is really, really interesting when you look into it and how these things develop and how you can actually combat against them. I think as well, um, art might be one of one of the best ways to actually communicate science because I think a lot of people, especially younger people, um, or uh, young, yeah, sorry, especially younger people, tend to like to have uh, more craft and more art sort of experiences, and mix, uh, mixing that with science just seems like it's a spot on way to to gauge more interest. Yeah, you agree? it's something creative and tactile. I mean, with the sculpture, the sculpture was brilliant for this. Because, I mean, I actually observed the sculpture for an hour when it first went out. And just the amount of kids which flocked to it was ridiculous. I even saw some literally shouting that they were really interested in science after it and they wanted to be scientists. Because they were reading all the facts that were around the base about, like, the sunsets being, like, a bluish hue on Mars and such. Like, it's stuff like that that really captivates them. I think the whole thing of the bee looking, you know, visually cool, they start to associate that with science as well in a positive light. So Colin Kelsey has also asked, um, can you give a couple of examples of the kind of comments that were added to the sculptures by the scientists? Uh, so some of them were <laughs> some of them were really cryptic um, equations and stuff left for other people. So one of the ones that was added was brand new LHC research, which hadn't been published yet. So I had this researcher from the University of Manchester come down and, and literally just handed me this wall of equations. I was like, I, I couldn't read it myself. I, I just like wrote them all down onto the bee's arm. And literally all the other physicists that came to sign just like sat there staring at this equation because it was so niche. <laughs> and they just like sat there trying to work it out. And one of them got sort of close and he was like, this, this is very, this is very niche. I can't really figure it out. And it turned out it was brand new research from LHCB from one of the main detectors for the Large Hadron Collider. And it's described in one of the events that they had um, recorded uh, in detail. <laughs> so that was quite exciting. And other ones were just like inspirational quotes. Uh, there's various facts. I can't really remember off the top of my head because it like literally there's been so many different things added to both sculptures and it's been a long time. 
They had quotes added by Danielle George about people that they should get interested in STEM and engineering, especially women, because obviously women's quite underrepresented in engineering. Uh, so she wanted to make sure that was listed there for anyone who was around to read it. I'm, I'm always impressed by the sense of humor uh, that scientists possess sometimes. Uh, when I see it on t-shirts, on tattoos and things like that, I'm always just blown away. A lot of them go over my head though. Um, so here's a question from Max Whiteley. In the long term, what are you uh, what are you wanting to show people with your games and art? So it's my, mainly different subjects. At the moment, I'm more focused on geoscience communication because that's my area. I'm working with the uh, <clears throat> the Energy and Environment Institute, so that is my primary focus at the moment, mainly flooding and climate change. But further down the line, I want to branch off into various other areas, such as physics, such as like all these very complex subjects that need to be kind of be brought back down to earth so it's more easily understandable. So I'm not really stuck with one thing. I'm open to any area of science. I want people to get from these games and to get from these art that anyone can be a scientist. Because I feel like a lot of people have this misconception that you have to be like this special, like, mega mind person to be a part of science when everyone really can be a part of science one way or another. I mean, look at me, I came from a really disadvantaged background um, <clears throat> where I left school not knowing anything. I only had my art and I gradually built back up and got interested in science through sheer coincidence and then combined the two together. And now I'm an actual scientist helping other scientists communicate their research. So I think that is really a key thing that I'm trying to go for with my work. So we have time for uh, two more questions. Um, I love this one, and it's actually been on my mind tonight a bit as well, and it's from Leslie Cunningham, who's not only like, really happy with your talk tonight, uh, but also wants to know what's the equation on your T-shirt about? So this, this is a standard model of particle physics. So this basically, it uh, covers all the known aspects and some of the unknown aspects of the standard model of particle physics. I think we're on the third line of it so far. So I think the rest needs to be either proved or disproved or added to. Yeah, I actually got this from CERN uh, on one of my first trips there to meet scientists and actually go underground to see the Atlas detector, which is this huge, like, it's basically a camera to photograph subatomic particles. So I got to go underground and see this thing, and it's mammoth. It's like, I think it's half the side of St. Paul's Cathedral or something ridiculous like that. It's a really amazing chance that I managed to get. I got to question some of the main people uh, behind a lot of the operations at CERN as well. So I managed to go through the data center where they have all these computers which are super cooled, which have like a trigger system. They have like gigabytes of data every second from these detectors put in to these servers and they have to choose what gets rejected and what gets saved for analysis and what gets sent off to research institutes all around the world really really amazing i got to question them all about this all about the, the new developments i got to see a um a piece of equipment being made as well i think it's actually functioning now because it's been years since i went there yeah amazing so we've got uh sarah whiteley has come back with another question asking do you have enough support and funding and if not where do you go to get them so I'm guessing this is for your, your your sculpture works. Yeah, so sculpture works, it's more off my own back. Um, whereas with like the like the research with the card games and stuff like that, my university's been really generous and given me a scholarship for both my master's and my PhD. Uh, they've been supportive of any other extra games projects I want to 
you know, experiment with. I mean, they gave me like a bit of extra funding for a new game last week, which I can't really talk about because, again, it's something brand new. But hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll be able to talk about it at AGU this December. <laughs> yeah. And finally, we don't have... Uh... I, I want to bring this up because I know you brought it up at the end of your talk, um, but Lewis has asked to talk more about this game festival, dates, links, and things to describe. I will also say Lewis did mention earlier that he has a virus board game, I think he said, um, that's all in Portuguese but could be translated. Um, we will be posting up all your links uh, and anything else to uh, sort of get more information about that, that event at the end of the talk tonight. Uh, so you can find that on Twitter. But really quickly, is there a, a go-to place that we can find out more? Yeah, so if you drop me an email uh, at the email displayed at the end of my slide, I'll keep you like updated on it. You can share with me this, uh, this game that you've made, uh, maybe even look into getting it translated for the event, because that sounds brilliant. Uh, as for dates and stuff, it's looking around September. We haven't got a... Um, we haven't got like a, um, a proper date yet because obviously we're having to reorganise everything with the coronavirus and assess things. So kind of waiting for the go-ahead from Pint of Science themselves first. Uh, if not, it'll probably be reorganised for early next year, I would imagine. But yeah, if you like send me a DM on like Twitter or you just email me, I, I will keep you in the loop. So we'll bring up those email addresses again uh, yeah. now so we can have another look. And again, we will be posting this uh, all on Twitter so people will be able to get in touch with you after as well. Just before we go, there's just a few things I wanted to bring up. They're not questions, but I just think they're wonderful comments. Um, wonderful presentation. I love your work. I hope I get a chance to see it one day. Um, and another one here, which I've seen. Uh, the artwork is amazing and a wonderful way of getting people into science. I've seen the B uh, when I get uh, when when it was on display. Um, hey. I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to say, because uh, we are going to have to wrap up now, but I just wanted to say thank you once again, Kelly, for uh, coming on tonight. It's been an eye-opening and wonderful talk, uh, not just to see your artwork, not just to hear about the amazing charity work and school engagement work that you're doing, but it's truly been an honor meeting you. And I hope I get to meet you in person soon after this whole lockdown is over. So thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to get in touch with uh, Kelly at any point, once again, we will be putting up links to her Twitter profile and her email in Twitter after the show. But for now, we're going to say bye to Kelly and thank you once again for being on the show. So that brings us to the end of our show. Thank you for joining and a massive thank you to both Kelly Stanford and Dr. Chris Clark uh, for being involved tonight. But just before you go, we have a little bit of news. So Cup of Science is going to be taking a break next week. So we won't have it on Tuesday next week. But fear not, because Pint Science is bringing you a special interview with British science journalist and author Angela Saini on her recent book, Superior, The Return of Race Science. To find out more, you can go to www.pintofscience.com. Um, that's .com, not .co.uk. Um, but if you're concerned about waiting a whole week before you get your next dose of science, then you're in luck, as Friday is the return of the Global Science Show, a virtual science festival that invites scientists and science communicators from around the world to share their own little slice of science uh, from wherever they are to wherever you are. Everything kicks off at 9 a.m. Uh, British Standard Time on Twitter. You can follow and watch the whole show using hashtag Global Science Show. I will be appearing on that show at some point on Friday as well. So if you uh, do tune in, I hope to see you there. Uh, well, that's it from us. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.